Sam Keen is the author of two books about science, The Disappearing Spoon and The Violinist Thumb. His books are not only about the technicalities of science, but also about the people and the culture of the scientific world. In his latest book, The Violinist Thumb, he describes a cast of eccentric characters that each need their own detailed biography, in my opinion. From the beginning of genetic discovery in the university labs to a nun in full habit tucked into a broom closet with her microscopes and beakers, to today's scientists who are moving science fiction toward reality. Sam draws you into these stories of personal struggle and triumph. Then on your journey, he teaches you something that you didn't even realize you were learning. He and his work have been featured on Radio Lab, All Things Considered, and Fresh Air, and he will actually be doing a live webinar for one of my clients, the American Chemical Society, in June. His latest book is The Violinist Thumb, and it's a New York Times bestseller and an Amazon Top 5 Science Book of the Year. And here to tell us about our own DNA and how we know what we know about it, please welcome Mr. Sam Keen. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out this afternoon and joining me. I appreciate it. So I'm going to be talking again about my book, The Violinist Thumb. And it's a book about genetics on the surface of it. But really, deep down, it's a storybook. It's a storybook about all aspects of human life. There are a number of specific historical stories uh, about you know people trying to prove or disprove ancient legends or stories of personal triumph or personal tragedy. But overall, it's kind of a storybook about human beings, about our big kind of overarching history as a species, kind of epic stories about who we are, where we came from, why we almost maybe went extinct at various points, these kind of big, big questions about humanity. And I thought I would jump right in with a few of my favorite stories from the book from a chapter that I like to call Retro Diagnoses. So the basic idea of retro diagnoses is that you want to figure out how your favorite historical celebrity died. So what you do is you look at when they lived, you look at where they lived, you look at their social circumstances, you look at what they complained about on their deathbed, you look at other symptoms, and from all of these different things, you kind of try to piece together how they might have died. So you retro-diagnose them. And doctors are really kind of incorrigible about doing this type of work. If you get a hold of a medical journal and start flipping through it, you'll see just paper after paper after paper saying that, you know, this emperor died of this, and this artist died of this, and everyone's an idiot for not realizing that this president had this disease. They really, really get into this. Uh, unfortunately, the field is a little trickier than you might imagine at first. Oftentimes, you're relying on testimony from witnesses who maybe quite didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't have a lot of medical knowledge a few hundred years ago, so they might not exactly get things right. Or you might be relying on sources that were compiled hundreds of years after people died. So they're as much legend as they are fact. And if you're not careful, you can get unmoored from reality pretty quickly. I have seen papers, serious papers, suggesting, for instance, that Beethoven died of syphilis, of all things, that Edgar Allan Poe died of rabies, which I guess would be kind of fittingly lurid for him, that Alexander the Great died of Ebola. Uh, just a partial list of all the things that Charles Darwin supposedly suffered from, just a partial list, include middle ear damage, pigeon allergies, arsenic poisoning, lactose intolerance, lupus, narcolepsy, agoraphobia, chronic fatigue syndrome, cyclical vomiting syndrome, and something called smoldering hepatitis. I've even seen serious, straight-faced suggestions diagnosing fictional characters with various diseases. Suggestions that Sherlock Holmes had autism, 
that Ebenezer Scrooge had obsessive compulsive disorder, that Darth Vader had borderline personality disorder. So, not bad. Um, I know you might think with this type of work that DNA maybe is a little more objective. You get somebody's bones from the ground or something, you do a test on it, you get a nice easy answer. They either had a disease or they didn't have it. But as I explain in the book, it's not quite that simple when it comes to genetics. There's still a lot of interpretation. There's still a bit of an art to figuring out whether someone had a disease or not. And there are certain cases where they started to look into uh, doing a genetic test and they decided to stop because they realized they wouldn't get a nice clean answer. Probably the best example in the book is with Abraham Lincoln. About two decades or so ago, they were going to do some genetic testing on him and they realized that they would have to destroy a little bit of these small artifacts and that they might not get a clear answer one way or the other. So they decided to hold off not do anything and they still really haven't gone back and looked at it today so it's still the question of whether he had a certain disease called Marfan syndrome is still kind of hanging out there but the story I'm going to talk about now actually explains one of the success stories of doing this type of genetic testing these retro diagnosing and that story gets started in about 1300 BC with an Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep IV. Uh, now, a few years into his reign, Amenhotep decided, you know what, enough with the Amenhoteps. We've already had four of them. I am going to change my name to Akhenaten. And that's what he's known as in history today, the very, very famous pharaoh Akhenaten. And more than anything else, Akhenaten was a reformer. He wanted to reform Egyptian society top to bottom. And the thing he was really excited about reforming was Egyptian religious services. Uh, traditionally, Egyptian people worshipped a lot of different gods, and they worshipped them at night. But Akhenaten was one of the first monotheists that we know of. He believed only in one god, the sun god, and he also wanted people to worship during the day, kind of the sun's prime afternoon hours. And as you can imagine, this got a lot of people upset. They didn't like this idea of changing their religious services. But uh, Akhenaten not only enforced that, he, be, he started enforcing a lot harsher uh, statutes on them too. For instance, he became something of a grammar Nazi in that he wouldn't let people use the plural hieroglyphic gods on public monuments. They would go and they would smash it if they saw the plural hieroglyphic. Uh, he also sent his thugs into people's homes, and if they saw, you know, a mug with a local god on it, they would take it and they would smash it on the ground because he couldn't stand the thought of there being a depiction of any other gods there. Now, as heretical as Akhenaten was with religion, he was equally heretical when it came to art because for the first time during Akhenaten's reign, you start to see a lot of realism, a lot of realistic depictions of things like birds or crocodiles or plants, things like that. You also start to see realistic depictions of scenes from Akhenaten's life. It might be Akhenaten just giving a smooch to his wife, the famous Queen Nefertiti. Or he might just be sitting down and having a meal with his son, the future King Tut. And a lot of people were kind of uh, you know, surprised by this, that the pharaoh would have himself depicted just doing these normal, mundane, everyday things. It was kind of a departure from normal Egyptian art. But for all of the realism in all of the art throughout all of Akhenaten's reign, there was one thing that was decidedly unrealistic. And that was Akhenaten himself. Because whenever Akhenaten himself was depicted, he always looked a little funny. He always looked a little off for some reason. There's another picture of him here. He's on the left. And if you listen to archaeologists describing what Akhenaten looks like, they can kind of sound like carnival barkers sometimes. One of them promises that you'll recoil from this epitome of physical repulsiveness. Another called Akhenaten a humanoid praying mantis. And if you look at the symptoms, they just go on and on that archaeologists have seen. An almond-shaped head, 
a concave chest, spidery arms, chicken legs with 